no, no. All right, Rangers lead the way, gentlemen. Super excited about this, uh, this lesson today, this uh, presentation, machine gun theory. So everyone knows how to mag dump, you know, or belt dump a machine gun into some trash or to the side of the hill. Or, you know, if you ever did a full auto experience at a range, like that's fun. You know, that's, you know, shooting full auto is awesome and more people should uh, be able to do it. Um, but there is a very distinct difference between using a machine gun for fun and for uh, not really for sport, but you know, for entertainment and proper application of an actual belt fed in context of small unit tactics and uh, infantry tactics. It's we're going to get into it here. Um, but basically it's what every battle drill essentially is really based on. Like if without a machine gun, like an organic machine gun, you you're not able to maneuver on the battlefield. So it's, it's super critical. And the, the, the theory and the machine gun specific knowledge I'm going to be passing on to you is important to get out there. Um, most of y'all don't have machine guns, obviously. However, that could change, you know, on a num based on a number of reasons. And you need to know how to properly employ and maximize your capabilities with these weapon systems. They're very cool. I love machine guns. They're sick. Um, and we're going to get right into it. So if any single event can be said to have transformed the history of warfare, it was the perfection of the true automatic machine gun by Hiram Maxim in 1885. Of all the hideous weapons of war produced in the 20th century, none have extracted a more deadly toll of human life than the machine gun. Cool little quote there. Um, I don't remember who initially said that. I'm sure you could Google it. An estimated five and a half million people were killed in World War One alone from just machine guns. Um, I think it was like a, the full number is like 20% of casualties on the battlefield were due to machine guns. It's, it's crazy. Like these things and when properly employed are, are insane. So an AAR from action Somalia, specifically operation Gothic servant serpent verified that the 762 machine gun is still the dismounted infantry platoons, most lethal weapon system. So why machine guns are important like we just talked about they're the most casually producing weapon at a squad level uh standard rifle squad in the u.s army carries two saw automatic squad saws squad automatic weapons uh in and typically they'll have a gun team attached as well but an organic squad will have two belt feds and in i want to say that russian doctrine i want to say they have at least one pkm if not two um they don't have like a like an LMG really type role. They have the RPK, uh, but it's not belt fed. It's still magazine fed, which uh, presents its own you know unique challenges. And it doesn't have a quick change barrel. They kind of try to use them as saws, and they are great because they do have a heavier barrel, so they don't overheat as much. Uh, but typically, the machine gun role in a Russian infantry squad is fulfilled by at least one or two PKMs. So all infantry doctrine is based around the machine gun. You need them to achieve fire superiority. Just the, the volume of fire that they're able to lay down in such a short amount of time makes it quick to be able to react to, you know, maybe a near ambush, ambush situation. And when you're initiating an ambush or initiating a raid, that overwhelming amount of firepower that you're able to bring to bear with one, two, three, four, or more machine guns it's very hard to be able to maneuver and to react to a well-trained and accurate support by fire element shooting machine guns. So we'll, we'll talk quickly about civilian options because there is more discussion about this coming out and more people are interested in them beyond the fact that they're fun to shoot at the range. So you have NFA atoms, so you have pre-86 or SOT. So pre-86 means that you can transfer these machine guns is just a as just regular civilian. You don't have to pay any extra special taxes aside from the two hundred dollar tax stamp. Um, there's not a whole lot of these on the market, uh, and they, when they are on the market, they're very expensive. Um, we're talking 
like for uh you know not even belt feds we're talking like just let's say you got an m16 lower right we're talking that's like i don't think i've seen any i haven't really looked but i haven't seen any go for you know less than 20k 10k at the very lowest um but even then if you want to be legal about it it's expensive uh sot is a special occupational tax i think it's like sot7 or something but it basically allows you to be able to transfer post dealer samples as well as manufacture your own machine guns i don't know exactly how much it costs but there's a whole lengthy list of uh of stuff you have to do to be able to qualify for this tax uh tax license and it's it's kind of difficult to get um so those are your two options for full autos as a civilian uh semi-auto belt feds you have the uh the fight light uppers which uh in recent history have made i know grantham made a video about these uh you have semi-auto saws and 240s and those are good grantham did a good video on why semi-auto belt feds still you know have their purpose and because you still can achieve a high rate of fire without having to you know do a mag change because you can link a, a 200 round drum to the the fight light or the civilian saw and that's 200 rounds you can get out, which is, you know, over a full combat load's worth. Just it's about a full combat load's worth of a dude shooting his M4 in just one drum. So there's still, you know, arguments to be said about why those are why those are valid and uh, useful in a civilian setting or in a, uh, you know, actual like belt fed or machine gun setting. However, they, they, they just still aren't a machine gun. It's, it's not a machine gun. They're cool. I think they have their uses. However, you're not going to be able to achieve the the same rate of fire as you would with an actual machine gun. So uh, you have forced reset triggers, which is kind of like a legal gray area. I know that ATF has gone after a lot of these, um, but you know, there's there's that. So these are your your legal options. I'm not going to talk about anything that's illegal here. So, but you can use your imagination. All right, so we're going to talk about the M249 first. So lightweight gas fed, belt fed gas operated air cooled weapon that fires from the open bolt position, chambered in 556, usually shooting a link of four to one ball tracer, uh, either M855 Alpha 1 or M855 with, uh, with you know, just standard tracer rounds. Um, sustained rate of fire, 85 rounds per minute, rapid 200 rounds per minute, cyclic 750 rounds per minute, and then it's accurate out to 600 meters as a point target or 800 meters as an area target on bipod. Someone, we we were taught that these can be mounted on tripod, and I'm sure that they can. I just literally have never seen a saw mounted on a tripod. They can be mounted on a tripod, from what I understand. It's just not very common if you have access to 240s. But if you were a civilian, and you're able to get your hands on a either a semi-auto or a full-auto saw, and you wanted a tripod, I think that option's out there for you. So you can you suppress effectively at 1,000 meters, and then your max effective range is 1,800 meters with a max range of 3,600 meters. And then you're going to hit that tracer burnout around 900 meters. M240, so belt-fed, air-cooled, gas-operated, crew-served, fully automatic machine gun that fires from the open bolt positioned. Sustained 100 rounds per minute, rapid 200 rounds per minute, cyclic 650 to 950 rounds per minute, depending on your gun and what gas setting you have it on. So on bipod, you can hit a 600 meter point target and an 800 meter area target. That's pretty accurate uh, when we would qualify with these when I was in a weapons squad. It, we, were, we were able to hit, you know, 800 meter area targets, which is would just be like a bunch of the, the like the Ivans in like a row. So it was like a kind of like a group of dudes, um, but it's pretty doable. And then tripod, 800 meter point. 1100 meter area and then 1800 meter suppression range grazing fire is 600 meters out we're going to talk about grazing fire fire later on max range 3725 meters and then tracer burnout the same as a saw about 900 meters all right so we're going to talk into how to shoot actually shoot a machine gun for accuracy here so the first thing i want to talk about is you have to treat these like you would treat a woman and <laughs> you have to ride them hard and put them to bed wet like you can't you can't be delicate with these things. They're they're machines. Like it's not like a rifle. You can't you don't have you can't like 
just baby like charging it, you know, like charging the gun, you know, clearing malfunctions. It requires legitimate brute strength. And if like some dudes just <laughs> for whatever reason weren't strong enough to run a machine gun, um, like when you get around stuck in the chamber, the bolt stuck forward, you would have to literally take the gun off the tripod and kick it open to get it to, to eject the shells or with the sometimes you'd get barrels stuck on the front of these guns and you try and do a barrel change and you wouldn't be able to do it. And you have to either kick the, kick the barrel off by kicking the front sight post, or you'd have to take a, another barrel and like smack the front of that thing off, uh, smack the front sight post to knock that barrel off. They, these are, these are, you know, large tools and you need to not baby them. They're, they're very durable. They're very strong. And, when you shoot in these things, you can't be a little bitch. So generally, this is how you're going to shoot it. Legs spread wide. You're going to dig into the ground with your toes. You're going to push forward into the bipod legs or the front leg of that tripod. And essentially what you're doing here is you're taking out all the slack of, of the weapon system. Because when we get later on here, we're going to talk about cone of fire and stuff. And this the, the more slack you are body position wise, the bigger your cone of fire is going to be and the less accurate you are. So... Doing this, leaning forward, sometimes I've seen people like grab the the front legs of the of the saw or they'll use the uh, well, you'll usually stick like a foregrip on the saw and and use that to lean into. You can do that, too. Or like do the whole uh, the whole push pull technique where you're you're pulling back on the front end of the gun and you're pushing forward while you're also digging your toes and while you're also leaning into the bipod into the ground. So you're like trying to dig those front bipod legs into the ground, essentially. And you're trying to make it so that when you fire it, fire that machine gun, it doesn't move beyond, you know, just a little bit of recoil. And the, I, I'm going to put, I, you've already seen it, but I put a video at the beginning of me shooting a PKM over in Iraq. And you can see, if you go back and watch it, you can tell when I was really like digging in because there's like no recoil. And then you can tell when I was a little bit more slack with it and you can see that I kind of get you know, just a little bit more rock back from the recoil. All right. So that non-firing hand. So you're typically you're going to shoot a in the right handed. Um, left handers don't usually have a good time uh, because it ejects brass out to the left. So if you're shooting, you know, or it shoots, excuse me, it ejects brass out to the right. So if you're shooting a left handed, you're going to be getting sprayed with your hot brass and it, it'll go down your sleeves and it's just a pain in the ass. So just shoot a machine in a right-handed, even if you are left that dominant. It's just, trust me, it's better. That non-firing hand is going to be up on that butt stock while you're shooting it. Um, let me see if we can go back here. So you see here how, how he's gripping this by the, uh, the back of his butt stock on this 240 right there. Same, same thing with the saw gunner here. He's gripping that and he's resting his cheek on it uh, because it is a little bit higher. The optics are going to be a little bit higher over the bore or over the stock than on your like your M4 as well as it gives it just makes it a little bit more comfier for your cheek to get that solid good cheek weld uh without like rocking your shit too much. So aim at the bottom left of the target. So because of the right-handed twist of these barrels that is naturally going to spin the rounds kind of up into the right. Um especially as like you fire and generally it's going to it's going to pull to the right. So Aim at the bottom left of the target, you know, unless it's like within, I would say probably 300 meters, in which case you can, you can get away with aiming, you know, right dead center at it. And then the biggest thing is don't short stroke the gun. So a lot of dudes will try and like let off like just two rounds, two or three rounds. And they'll like let go of the trigger, like, and they'll not let it fully cycle. And it's kind of hard to explain, uh, but you just want to you want to give it a solid squeeze of the trigger and don't let go of it until you're actually going to let go of it and then give it a full let go. Don't half ass uh, letting go of the trigger because you're going to cause a malfunction with that sear being released. So do the full burst. Don't don't try and cut it short. All right. So real quick safety point. Runaway gun happens when that sear we were just talking about is too worn or breaks or whatever to catch the bolt when the when the gunner releases the trigger it can be dangerous. Um, sometimes you know it, it happens, especially with older machine guns if they haven't been maintained properly or you know PMC not, not PMCS per se, but uh you know checked 
like uh like most military weapons go through every year um with the weapons uh i forgot their names but they usually get checked so this this usually gets caught however it can still happen so you got three options if your gun is shooting you've let go of the trigger and it's still shooting so first option ride the lightning and at this point you're just going to hold it and keep firing it into a safe direction until the belt runs out kind of fun um gives you gangster status if you do it but, uh option two break links so basically you're going to grab the links, the belt that's going into the gun, and you're going to break it off and then let the rest of them run out. And then you, you it won't be firing anymore. And then this one that's kind of related, you can induce a malfunction. So machine guns are a little bit finicky, especially with how the bullets feed into them. What you want to do is like twist the belt to uh, almost break it, but basically jam it up so that it doesn't feed properly and that'll stop it as well. So Something that uh, you got to know when you come, when we're talking about machine guns here is, is how to safely handle this. I've had one runaway gun on myself. It wasn't a U.S. weapon. Uh, it was the same day, actually, that I shot that PKM. We were, they had, uh, the partner force we were with had a couple of MG3s, which is the 7.62 variant of the MG42. Um, and we had, we had a couple of those out there. And I shot one of them, and within the first burst, I had a runaway gun. Um, the sear was just was just done and I was like, all right, screw <laughs> and rode the lightning, let the belt burn out. And then uh, we put the gun away. So it does happen. So, you know, just be aware of it. All right. We're talking parts here just real quick so that when uh, we get further on, we can uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. So you got your cover feed tray cover. You got your feed tray butt stock. You've got your uh, bolt operating rod assembly, drive spring rod assembly. Trigger, trigger housing, receiver, and then your barrel assembly. You've got your barrel quick change handle here, front sight post, your gas regulator. Um, and then, yeah, and inside you've got rails, which this this bolt rides along. And then this is your uh, your piston, your uh, your drive rod, essentially. This is, you know, a, uh, a piston operated machine. All right. We'll talk loading machine in real quick. This is all stuff you can figure out elsewhere as well. So if I go too fast, go find it elsewhere or just rewatch it again until you get it. Clear the weapon. So you're going to pull back on that charging handle. So charging handle is on the other side of the gun on um, U.S. machine guns. I think on the PKMs and the MG3, that's most general, generally that uh, charging handle is going to be on the right side of the gun. So pull the charging handle back. You're going to put that safety on because, again, if it has a, uh, a worn sear, it's not going to get caught. So it's just generally a good idea to put that safety on misspelled, uh, disregard. And then you're gonna push that handle forward. So open the feed tray cover, lift and then brush off any links that are on there, lift the feed tray, visually inspect the chamber, the bolt face and clear any loose links or brass that's in the, in the ejection area down underneath the gun or you know inside, maybe inside the chamber area or with the saw inside that magazine well um, that can cause some problems there. You're going to drop the feed tray, not the feed tray cover, just the feed tray. You're going to place the rounds on the feed tray, ensuring that brass is to grass and rounds are resting against the feed tray. And then you're going to firmly close that feed tray cover. Uh, make sure those rounds are resting against the very back of that feed tray. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have some problems. But generally pretty easy to do. There's uh, the starter clips for saws that make it really easy, especially at night. Um, so super easy. So... This is going to be the more specific and niche machine gun knowledge and how to properly employ this. This is going to be a long video. I apologize. This might get cut into two halves, but all right. So this is your, this is a Ranger machine gun team here. We got the gunner. We got another gunner and what looks like an assistant gunner back here using the 240 Limas. And we usually had a mix of short barrels and long barrels. And typically we'd have an Elkan Spectre one to six on these guns. Um, which was pretty great. Um, you, you definitely want some kind of magnified optic on the on the larger machine guns and even on saws. When I was a saw gunner, I would I always used a Elkan one to four. Um, some dudes would use Eotex, and some you would use them with three buys. And there's a, one of the platoons like to use Aimpoint T2s, which I always thought was an interesting choice. Um, I'm sure they had the reasoning behind it, but it just didn't make sense to me. You, you know, you want to be able to see out to that 800 meters to be able to engage those far targets. All right. So these are the roles in your 
you know, weapon squad or gun team. And this is, you know, this might be different based on your unit. This is how regiment does it and how you do it in ranger school as well. So you have your gunner, gun team leader. Um, you have your assistant gunner, your ammo bearer or ammo bitch, and then you have your weapon squad leader. So at minimum, a gun team is going to consist of a gunner and assistant gunner. A lot of the times there's just not enough dudes to have a third guy in that gun team. So it was all that ammo was split between the gunner and the assistant gunner. So I've seen it to where gun team leader isn't necessarily a, it is a role, but he could be anyone in that, in that gun team. He can be the gunner. He can be the assistant gunner. He could be the ammo bearer. Generally, he's going to be either the gunner or the assistant gunner. I know that we experimented with having the gunner be the assistant gunner and then having that private be the gunner. Um, there's pros and cons to each, but when I was the gun team leader, I was on the gun because I had more experience on the machine gun and I knew how to run that thing. All right, so that gun team leader is responsible for accountability of his team of AG and AB, cleanliness of his weapon, knowing, knowing all TRPs, knowing the mission, training his tr team in crew drills, initiating crew drills actually out on the uh, out on the range or out on the support by fire or out on target, and then firing his weapon accurately on time at the right target when we're talking about uh, – rates of fire here later on that's that's going to be you'll that'll make more sense and then he's also responsible for claiming malfunctions your assistant gunner he's going to carry the spare ammo tripod and spare barrel the gunner will carry ammo too generally um but he's not carrying as much and it'll it'll usually be on his back where his assistant gunner can get to it ensures proper feeding of rounds into the gun keeps track of ammo expenditure responsible for barrel changes moving from tripod to bipod or bipod to tripod Assistant cleaning the machine gun and is ready to replace the gunner in case the gunner is killed. So a dead gunner drill or one-up drill. Ammo bearer. Carries ammo, potentially a third spare barrel. Can engage targets with his personal weapon and then helps provide local security for the gun team and the support by fire at large. And then he's ready to replace the AG or the gunner in a one-up drill. Um, generally, it'll go, if the, if the gunner gets killed, AG will hop on the gun. AB, if you have one, will hop into, into the AG roll. But uh, yeah, that's generally how it's going to go. The ammo bear, he doesn't have a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of responsibility. He's there to basically do whatever that gun team leader needs to do because he needs that assistant gunner to help feed his weapon and to keep it keep it running to keep it shooting on the line. All right, weapon squad leader responsible for all gun teams and their success or failure. Supervises maintenance of the machine guns. Rotates loads. Uh, machine gunners are usually the first ones to get tired because you are carrying a lot of shit. So he's going to collect laser reports, liquid ammo casualty equipment, designates interlocking sectors of fire, principal direction of fire, and secondary sectors for guns, gives fire commands to include shift fires, alternating firing guns, and controls rates of fire and fire distribution. He knows the location of assault and security elements and prevents fratricide, and he reports directly to the PL. So the weasel is a, it's a very difficult, I wouldn't say very difficult, but it's a very demanding job a little you know i wouldn't say more so than your average squad leader but it's generally the most the second most senior enlisted guy next to the platoon sergeant in the platoon because he's in charge of an entire element of dudes with freaking machine guns like he's got to know everything about the guns he's got to know exactly how the mission's going to go so he has to you know know what it looks like on the assault side of things so that he knows you know fit proper shifting when you're like 15 degrees off or whatever um when that assault element starts encroaching on that, on that support by fires, um, 15 degrees, we'll talk about this in a, in a designated support by fire class as well. So the big thing is, is giving those commands to shift and lift fires, confirming that the gunners know that, and then, you know, signaling back to the assault element that those guns are shifted and lifted. All right. So we're going to talk about equipment here, um, real quick, cause it's important. This is not going to be a comprehensive list. This is going to be stuff that I've gained over my knowledge over my years as, you know, a saw gunner and a gun team leader did about three years, probably cumulatively um, between all that. And yeah, I like machine guns and, you know, I've uncovered some tips and tricks over my time to help make them run good. So as far as team equipment goes, when you're going out, you're going to want to have 800 to a thousand rounds of ammo minimum per gun. Um, as a saw gunner, you're going to carry six to 800 and that's, that's like minimum. That's like when we talk about machine gun math later on, you're going to see that that's really 
not a whole lot of of time being bought with those with that rounds that amount of rounds so on support by fires we would sometimes carry more we'd carry you know 14 1400 1500 rounds and we'd shoot most of them all right so you're going to want to have at minimum one spare barrel uh there's a lot of things that can go wrong with your barrel it can get too hot to where it's not accurate anymore you can melt the uh you can melt the barrel you don't want to you know force yourself to melt the barrel you want to have a, a barrel you can swap out um, or you could get a round stuck in the barrel to where you can't get it out in the field. So you'll have to, you know, just use the one. Um, sometimes we would carry two extra spares for the 240. If we were bringing out a ton of ammo, um, we'd, we'd try and bring it. If there was an extra barrel for, you know, a third barrel for a gun, we'd try and bring it. Tripod. And then that gun is going to want to have a sling, magnified optic, and a laser at minimum. Usually, saw gunners would put a light on their guns. Uh, we wouldn't ever run lights on the 240s because you're not going to you ever freaking clear a room with those things. So, And then you're going to want a barrel bag and a round ruck. Um, this is a, a contraption that we would do. We'd have these molly frame backpacks, and we'd attach our barrel bags to those as well as, or like attach straps to be able to buckle in our barrel bags. And then we'd run pouches or ammo, uh, ammo purses that were attached to those as well to be able to feed out of the gun. You've got a clearing you'd want to bring. We would sometimes we didn't do this as much as we should have, but bringing clearing rods or cleaning rods out to be able to clear those, those hard stuck rounds out in the field. Uh, you're going to want a cleaning kit to include machine gun specific tools. And then sometimes we'd have barrel change mitts. Generally, uh, you're able to do it with the handle and not burn yourself. All right. So this is what I was talking about. This is that just like a molly, just a flat molly pack where you can throw whatever pouches you want on it. So we'd have like the the barrel change, the, the barrel bags off to one side. And then we'd have ammo purses or ammo pouches on here that would hold, you know, another. We would try and get like 400. 500 rounds on one of these packs. And this is uh, this is what a barrel bag generally looks like. So sometimes I'll have a sling. We would take those slings off and then you got buckles to steal it up. And it's full of uh, this heat resistant material. So you can put a hot ass barrel inside without burning it. All right. So these are the machine gun specific cleaning tools we're talking about. So this is a Gerber uh, machine gun multi-tool. It has scraping devices or scraping tools implements for both the 240 and the 249. Um, that are like specifically designed to scrape off like your gas tube, your, uh, the front end of your piston, etc., etc. This is, uh, like a standard army issue scraping tool. And then you have a steel pea brush, which we would use to, we'd sometimes have to lube the rounds just to make them feed better. And then other times, you know, or when you're, uh, storing the guns in the gun box, we would, uh, like in route to deployment or a training event, we would generally try to wipe down at least the barrels with the, uh, with the CLP brush. All right. So individual equipment as a gunner and a AG, you're going to want to have a flathead screwdriver, a multi-tool LSA or automatic transmission fluid, a CLP brush for the ammo. And then you're going to want to have that CR, uh, that GRG gridded reference graphic or TRP target reference point graphic. Uh, on hand so that if you forget while you're up on the line, you can you can quickly reference that to make sure that uh, you're not shooting close to friendlies. And then gloves. As a machine gun team leader or as a machine gun assistant gunner, you need to have gloves. That's like an it's like a, a no argument. Some dudes don't wear them out, you know, as an assaulter, which I mean, most 99% of the time they do. But as a machine gunner, you absolutely have to have gloves because those things get so damn hot. And you'll still melt your glove, but it won't be your skin right away. Every Ask any machine gunner, ask anyone who's spent any time in a weapon squad, and everyone's been burned by a hot barrel at least once. And potentially worse if they didn't have gloves. So, all right. Cleaning machine gun. Right here, this is your, your gas regulator here. This thing gets absolutely filthy. So keeping this cleaned and scraped and clear is crucial. That's the biggest part. The other big part for the barrel is obviously the bore. You want to wipe that out with bore snakes and then make sure that rifling is still good. And then you have the, uh, I don't know the exact nomenclature for this part right here, but this is where it locks into the actual receiver. 
And if these rings are, are filthy, it's going to get stuck and you're not going to be able to do a barrel change. So you want to make sure that that gets cleaned. All right. On the bolt operating rod assembly, you have the front of the piston here. This needs to be silver like this before you go out on a mission. It needs to be pristine. If there's any kind of, you know, built up carbon on the end, this is where generally things go wrong is when this thing, this part of the gun is not clean. Uh, the back of it doesn't get too bad and we're missing the picture of the bolt here, but the, uh, the bolt needs to be wiped down and free of any carbon as well. But the biggest piece is here, right here, and then this gas regulator, and then this, and then the bore. And then inside the receiver, um, I don't have a good picture of it, but I couldn't find one. There's rails that the, uh, that this and the bolt ride on, and those need to be clean as well, clean and lubed. Basically any, any part that you see that's like shiny metal needs to be lubed and clean as possible. All right, so gun drills. You've got barrel change every 10 minutes for sustained rate of fire, two minutes for rapid, and then every minute on the minute for cyclic. You've got tripod to bipod, bipod to tripod, dead gunner drill, linking rounds, which not really a gun drill. It's just a kind of a general weapon squad specific skill. Displacing on the on the support by fire berm, either to move down uh, to continue firing and to continue having open avenues of fire or displacing after the end of a, of a mission. And then you have emplacement, which can be before an ambush, before a raid. Um, and this generally one gun will go up at a time. The first gun will go up, get on, be on bipod. And then the next guns will come up already on tripod. Uh, and then that's that first gun will go to bipod or tripod rather. But these need, this is what you need to be training with is if you have a machine gun, if you've got a group of dudes and you have machine guns, you need to designate, you need to figure out your gun team and they need to practice as much as this as you can. I know I understand you might not have a tripod, but you should hopefully have an extra barrel and you should be able to, you know, to train that barrel changing in the dark and whatever have you. So rates of fire. Sustained is generally going to be 100 rounds per minute, which is a three to five round burst every four to five seconds. We have sustained count, which I don't remember the exact specific name of this, but basically it's a sustained burst, three to round, five round burst at an interval set by that weapon squad leader. So when you're on the line and you're, you've got two other machine guns, let's say you're gun one, you're going to give your sustained rate of fire burst. So, you know, three to five round burst, and then you're counting down one or counting up 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, and then that next gun on the line in the order should be shooting. And if he isn't ready to shoot, then you either need to shoot and then say, start on me, or that third gun will hopefully be paying attention and pick up and shoot, um, especially if that gun is down for whatever reason. So sustained count, again, not the actual aim for it. I don't remember if we actually had a name for it, but three to five round bursts and an interval set by the weapon squad leader. So he would say sustain eight. So now there's eight seconds in between each burst. And this is done to, to conserve ammo. Um, especially if you've already been hammering the objective for a sustained amount of time for like a raid uh, platoon level action or whatever. If you got rapid, which is a, you know, 200 rounds per minute, six to nine round bursts every four to five seconds. And then cyclic, you wouldn't, we would never go cyclic. Um, we would maybe do it for a few seconds during a uh, battlefield handover. Um, but we'll talk about that in the support by fire class. So it's important to know this because we're going to be talking about machine gun math towards the end. All right, this is the actual technical machine gun knowledge we're going to be talking about here. So cone of fire is the pattern formed by different trajectories in each burst as they travel down range. So different trajectories of each bullet in each burst as they travel down range. So vibration in the weapon system, ammunition, weather conditions, skill of the gunner, whether it's on tripod, whether it's on bipod, are all going to contribute to how large this cone of fire and how big this beaten zone is going to end up being. So if you're a good machine gunner, you have a nice and tight cone of fire. This is when we were talking about at the beginning, how to shoot it. You want to be taking all the slack out of it so that the only variations and the only thing is causing the, this cone of fire to open up is, you know, the, the harmonics of the weapon system, the ammunition and the weather. Like you shouldn't, your cone of fire should never 
be affected by the machine gunner's skill level if you're a good machine gunner. All right, so the beaten zone. Elliptical pattern formed when the rounds in the cone of fire strike the ground or the target. So it's normally cigar or oval shaped. So the density of the rounds decreases towards the edges. They try to engage targets to the maximum effect of the beaten zone. So this is, you know, hitting the ground here. But imagine this if it was, you know, up on a wall or on a like a building. It'll generally be oval shaped. And, you know, if the, better, the more accurate you are, the, the smaller it's going to be. Um, sometimes you do want to open up your beaten zone, though. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute here. All right, so you got your primary sector fire, which is the area covered by a gun team to cover the most likely avenue of enemy approach. Also can be the most, uh, you can split a, a target objective up and, you know, give one gun team their primary sector, which could be, you know, this building series to this building series, and then, you know, that so on and forth, so forth down the line. Secondary sector of fire is the area covered by a gun team to cover the second most likely avenue of enemy approach. These are kind of more for like the defensive kind of employments of machine guns. And then you have your principal direction of fire. So it's similar to a primary sector of fire. It's basically covering angle with good fields of fire or that it has a likely area of dismounted approach. So we've got classes of automatic weapons fire. We have respect to the ground, respect to the target, and respect to the gun. So respect to the ground. This is, we're talking about the the bullets and how they're traveling in respect to the ground so when the center of the cone of, so with grazing fires we, we kind of mentioned this earlier on so the center of the cone of fire fails to rise above a meter above the ground so it's typically employed in the final protective line in defense we're not going to talk about this in this video that's going to be in the patrol base class and then you're going to be firing over generally level or uniformly sloping terrain and the M249 and M240 can attain uh, 600 meters of grazing at fire. Plunging fire occurs when there's little to no danger space from the muzzle to the beaten zone. So occurs when firing at long range from high to low ground into abrupt, abruptly rising ground or across uneven terrain, resulting in a loss of grazing fire at any point along the trajectory. So kind of a mouthful there, but basically if there's space for you to stand up underneath the gun, you're, you're shooting and you're doing plunging fire. Or if someone was walking towards you and they could walk underneath because of terrain or because you were shooting, you know, at a, at a higher elevation target, that's that's plunging fire technically. So demonstration here of grazing fire. So pretty flat terrain here and it's rising no more than a meter above the ground. So plunging fire, kind of a blurry graphic here, I apologize. So you can see here we're shooting up and over into the high ground here and all this is you know, is safe for us to be in. So there's no danger space, you know, right here. Like it's all the cone of fire is opening up and then that, that beaten zone is, is well over your head. So same thing with shooting high to low. You've got this, this uh, lack of danger space here and then low to high right here. You, you can, you can, you know, maneuver underneath that. So all those are examples of plunging fire. All right. So respect the target. So, this is going to be how your bullets are affecting and striking your actual target. So leaders and gunners should strive at all times to position their guns where they can best take advantage of the beaten zone with respect to an enemy target. So that oval shaped pattern of, you know, naturally occurring oval shaped pattern of, you know, bullets. That you should be looking to maximize the coverage on the target. So you want to be able to channel the enemy by use of terrain or obstacles so that they approach the machine gun position from the front, either in a column or a file formation is a good example. So if you're able to get them to walk down a road or walk through a clearing in a certain manner, and then you've got that machine gun team set up with, uh, to achieve, you know, we're, we're going to get into it here. So inflating fire when the beaten zone and the cone of fire coincide or in close to coinciding, it can be frontal fire on a column or flanking fire on a line. So frontal fire, the long axis, you know, the, the long part of the cigar shape of the beaten zone is at a right angle to the front of the target. So best use against columns. So if they're coming towards you, that beaten zone is, is kind of going back alongside. Flanking fire, delivered towards the flank of the target. Again, best used along a line because that, that long axis, the beaten zone is going to be covering 
more personnel than if you were to be shooting them in the front where your your beaten zone is only going to be hitting you know one or two dudes oblique fire occurs when the long axis of the beaten zone is at any other angle other than a right angle all right inflating fire this is what every machine gunner's wet dream is is a l-shaped ambush achieving of inflating fire against a column or a line of dudes so you can see here that long axis of the beaten zone is is just gonna fuck those dudes up he doesn't have to traverse the gun very far he doesn't have to you know do any elevation changes to the gun it's right there they're all right there and it's a bad time um, inflating fire can also be achieved against the line if they're online and you're hitting them from the side that long axis is covering more dudes than if you were shooting at them dead on and they're in a line all right frontal fire so not necessarily inflating fire here um, because they're kind of spread out, but they're, they're generally approaching the machine gun position, you know, from the front. Flanking fire. So we've got a, a line here and they're hitting them from the side. So the, uh, the long axis of that beaten zone is, you know, coming out this way. So not as effective as inflating fire, but it's flanking fire. It's still, uh, it's still not too bad. You don't want to be using frontal fire against a line and you don't want to be using flanking fire against a column necessarily. You want to be trying to get to the front of those. So your oblique fire again, angled, it's not a perfect, uh, perfect right angle. All right. Fire with respect to the gun. Fixed means the fire delivered against a stationary point target where the depth and width of the beaten zone covers the target with no manipulation needed. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Traversing disperses fire in width by su successive changes in direction, but not elevation. So delivered against a wide target with minimal depth. So you're this is you know traverse. Searching distributes fire in depth by successive changes in elevation, employed against a target with depth and minimal width. So you know raising the gun up or down. Search and traverse. So it's a combination of. Yep. No, oh, we mix. Oh, yep. Good. Sorry. Search and traverse combo of successive changes in direction and elevation resulting in distribution of fires in width and depth deployed employed against targets whose long axis is oblique to the direction of fire. You've got a swinging traverse employed against targets that require major changes in direction, either right or left, but minimal changes in elevation up or down. And then free gun employed against rapidly moving targets. So like vehicles that are hauling ass or dudes that are sprinting, you're going to pop that T and E out of the tripod and you're going to be able to, to swivel that gun, you know, pretty freely. So here's some, here's some pictures demonstrating fixed, you know, you're shooting a point target or a specific part of a building or vehicle. that's not moving traverse. You know, you've got a wider, you know, maybe a, a formation of troops that's uh, still generally close together or a building or a large vehicle that you want to be uh engaging so that's your that's your traversing fire again you're not moving very far left and right you got search again changes in elevation so you're shooting your, your beaten zone is going to be increasing in depth or decreasing traverse and search so again that oblique that oblique line so you're both your elevation and your uh damn i've been talking for too long yeah elevation and your uh right and left are are kind of both changing but still not as open as free gun so swinging traverse you know you open it up against a maybe a moving target that's moving right to left or left to right so a little bit more drastic changes right and left i guess across that horizontal plane and then free gun is a rapidly moving target so if it's you know it's a dude zigzagging you want to be in a, in a free gun so you can you know follow him and lead him out all right i think that's the end of it all right so yeah end of the presentation went longer uh but i had a lot of you know knowledge that i didn't have written down in the powerpoint that i wanted to get out to you guys so Hopefully this was useful. Um, there's going to be a part two follow up uh, later on, um, specifically about support by fire and how a support by fire should run, kind of how to emplace one, and you know, kind of like some TTPs, SOPs that I can that I can share without uh, revealing too much. Um, 
But this knowledge is, is super important. You know, it's one thing to own a machine gun that's super cool, but it's even cooler if you know how to properly employ them. And hopefully this, uh, this will help you out when it comes to uh, employment of that weapon system. You can find all this information, most of it, in the Ranger Handbook. Um, you can find the Ranger Handbook on AmericanaPipeDream.com. They're not paying me to say that. I just know that they've got good copies of it. And you can find it online for free as a PDF as well. So, But I would recommend getting at least one paper copy of it. That's it for today. Uh, I'll have to look at my schedule. I'm not entirely sure which class I've got next. But take care, y'all. Thanks for watching.